So, now we will try to see that how does this true error that we see depend on the model complexity ok. So, using Stein's lemma and some trickery we can show the following what is Stein's lemma. So, I had this deal with my students last year you do not ask me what Stein's lemma is I will not ask you what Stein's lemma is ok. So, it is some lemma which tells us that ok that this quantity what was this quantity the last term which was troublesome right that covariance term which was troublesome that is this quantity. This quantity is actually equal to this quantity. So, let us buy that let us all of us agree that Stein's lemma is correct and it tells us that this is the case ok and you saw the quiz one paper ok fine from last year I mean ok. So, now we will work with this premise and we will see what it actually tells us. Now, when will uh, this quantity be high? So, what this is telling is let us I mean jokes apart let us try to focus again uh, that this quantity is actually equal to the summation of this quantity ok. Now, let us take one term in this summation when would the dou f hat x i by dou y i be large? What does it actually tell you? If I change one of these y i's a bit then the prediction for it is going to change by a lot. Do you get that? How many should get this? Some of you do not get this ok just think about it when would this be high? What does the derivative capture? If the derivative is high that means a small change in the denominator is going to lead to a large change in the numerator. What is the denominator actually? The true y that we have observed. What is the numerator? The predicted y. So, what you are saying is that if there is a small change in y i then there is going to be a large change in the prediction ok. When would this happen? Would this happen for simple models or complex models? Complex models how many of you say complex models ok. So, this is the link to model complexity right and I will make a more uh, intuitive uh, case for this, but at least some of you get this that if your model is very complex that means if even one of your data points changes then the prediction of the model is going to change largely. So, now relate this back to that sinusoidal model that we had and we had this complex model every model that I was training which was trained on a different set of 25 examples the model was vastly different and that is exactly what was happening when you are changing even one data point your predictions were changing largely that means your model was changing largely do you get that intuition ok. So, indeed a complex model will be more sensitive to the changes in the observation whereas, a simple model will be less sensitive to it ok and hence we can say that the true error is actually the equal to the empirical train error plus something which relates to the model complexity is that fine. Now, let us first verify that indeed a complex model is more sensitive to minor changes in the data. So, this is some data that I had sampled from the same distribution and I trained one simple model which is the green line which you see that was a linear model and I trained one complex model which was a 25 degree polynomial which you see ok. And now, what I am going to do is I am going to take one of these points and change it a bit and I retrain the model. What happens to the simple model? It does not change much, but what happens to the complex model? It is more sensitive to these observations that I have and that is exactly the quantity that we were interested in. That means, a complex for a complex model which is more sensitive that summation that we care about is going to be high. That means, the difference between the true error and the estimated error is going to be high. So, that is why instead of minimizing the train error we should always minimize the train error plus some quantity which is linked to the model complexity. This is the basis for all dash methods regularization methods. So, now you see where this comes from. So, ok. So, where omega theta would be high for complex models and simple for simple models ok. You get the intuition for this and the rest of the lecture we will spend in taking various cases where we will actually show that omega theta would be high and we are trying to control for omega theta ok. This quantity for the rest of this lecture and for the rest of this course I will assume that we all know how to deal with. We have done enough of this, we have done lot of back propagation, we have done enough derivations of the loss with respect to the output layer and so on everything right. So, all of us understand how to deal with L train theta where L train theta is this i equal to 1 to m squared error loss or your log likelihood or any of these losses right. So, we all know how to deal with this. Today we are going to focus on this other term 
which brings in the regularization ok. So, what omega theta does is it actually acts as an approximation for this. So, what I should have actually tried to minimize is not just L train theta, but L train theta plus this other quantity which was there in my equation you get this. My true equation was that my loss is equal to L train theta plus this term right which we approximated using Stein's lemma. So, I should have tra tried to minimize this quantity, but I do not know how to really compute this quantity. So, I am going to just substitute it by omega theta and ensure that omega theta is such that it is high for complex models and low for simple models. Do you get the recipe? Everyone gets this, how many of you understand this? Fine. So, and we can show that uh, L1 regularization, L2 regularization, early stopping all of these are actually uh, spatial cases of this particular formulation that we have ok. And remember that this is the sweet spot that we were aiming for ok and this gap is actually this quantity because we are making a very optimistic estimation of the error whereas there is actually this quantity which we have been ignoring and that is why we see that the validation error is high ok. So, is the full picture in terms of the diagram and all the equations that we have seen clear? So, we should ensure using omega theta that this gap is also minimized. Therefore, our function should be minimize L theta plus omega theta. So, that essentially what we are trying to do is minimize this gap and hence the model would generalize better on the test data. Is this intuition clear to everyone? Okay. But why do we care about this bias variance trade off and model complexity? This is not a course on machine learning. They are highly complex models, they have many parameters, many nonlinearities. In fact, now can you relate this back to the universal approximation theorem? What does the universal approximation theorem say? Give me any data, I will give you a deep neural network which will exactly overfit the data, right? And that is exactly what we want to avoid, right? That is why regularization is important in the context of deep neural networks, right? it is very easy for them to overfit the data and drive the training error to 0 and that is why we need some regularization ok. So, today we are going to look at different forms of regularization starting with L2 regularization, some trim simple tricks. So, some of these are going to be mathematically motivated, some of these are just going to be heuristics or empirical stuff. So, data set augmentation is one such empirical stuff. How many of you tried data set augmentation for the MNIST assignment for the back propagation assignment? Parameter sharing and tying is something that no I am not please do not give me that look here. Yeah. I am not suggesting that. Adding noise to the inputs, adding noise to the outputs, early stopping, ensemble methods and drop off right. So, these are the things that we are going to talk about this and all of this is in the context of regularization where we want to avoid some kind of model complexity ok. Mm -hmm.